Sean Haney here with realagriculture.com and Real Ag Radio, Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. Well, if you've been listening to Real Agriculture in this show for a long time, you know that there's a lot of excitement about the opportunity for renewable diesel. What does it mean for your farm? And kind of what is the market outlook at this point? Because I don't know if we've had a little bit of a buzzkill, but it seems like a little bit has been taken off a bit of the hype machine. We'll, we'll see. But we're joined right now by... Jenna Lansing, she is director of Agri-Food Watch Desk with Aimpoint Research, and they've got a new report out at Aimpoint Research talking about renewable diesel in the market outlook. And Jenna joins us right now. Jenna, great to uh, great to meet you and have you here. Yeah, it's great to be here too. Thank you for having me, Sean. Yeah. Okay. So let, let's start off right at the top. I mentioned, you know, like the you know the hype machine and all the excitement about renewable diesel when, when you're putting this study together. Um, I I, I guess. Is this all hype or is there reality here that is going to make a big difference at the farm gate long term? Overall, I think if you look at some of the key trends of sustainability and where government's at on both the federal state or in the United States here as well globally, there's a lot of alignment around sustainability and how we better secure our futures. With, within that, there's obviously a lot of emphasis on environmental which where the fuel comes into place and they're reevaluating the energy complex. The other thing, I think there's also a consumer dynamic to this as well that's driving this, that I think there is some long-term uh, opportunity here. It's just going to be a bit of a bumpy road as the industries get up and get going. And I think uh, you can, there's some past experiences in agriculture that it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows as stuff got started. And that's where we're at right now. Uh, ethanol would be a prime example of that, but we can, we don't need to go down that rabbit hole today. Yeah. You know, I, I guess one of the interesting pieces about this is when we had the EPA come out with their, their final R, R, um, RVOs here for the next uh, three years, there was disappointment. And um, I, I guess how much does that decision weigh on the amount of construction that has to happen from a crush plant? perspective and and these renewable diesel plants how big of a factor will that be i think it'll be a factor but i don't think it'll be as big as maybe some are concerned about and the reason i say that is if you look at the rbo requirements you have the the bio-based category and then you have the advanced category and the bio d or the renewable diesel producers can leverage that advanced category However, there's potential that there could be some competitive dynamics to secure the RINs and leverage those R, that RBO, right? So that's a key question or factor to take into consideration. And then I, the biggest concern is, yes, that the capacity levels that are estimated to come online in the next couple of years will produce over the RBO, uh, what are the RBO levels that they set. So there's going to be issues there, but the person that's going to get squeezed in this is the person that isn't operating today. So somebody that's got operation today and is expanding, they're going to be able to leverage this and take advantage of it. But it's these new plants that aren't operating yet that are really going to be impacted by this. The other thing I think we need to look at in the RBOs and look where this renewable diesel is currently going that will drive some of this. So you got 99% of it going into California for the low carbon fuel standard. Whereas the other 1% is going into Oregon, I believe, uh, to meet some of their requirements. So, and California is subsidizing the heck out of uh, the renewable diesel going or under the LCFS. So that's helping support some of the economics. But overall, this will have an impact, but it's more going to impact the guy or the folks that don't have plants up and operating. How, how big of a threat? is like right now government policy really kind of on both sides of the aisle i i would suggest pro biofuel um and and renewable diesel obviously is a component of that um if, if there was a switch in the attitude of of policy makers uh, around this topic how, how big of a threat is that because like you said california heavily subsidizes is one example what if that was to change what happens to the industry I there's obviously going to be some bumps with policy changes as different parties to have control of the Senate and the House or have the White House. There's going to be some bumps in the road because of that. But I think overall, the trend line is heading. This is the direction we're going. There'll be minor tweaks along the way that we have to adjust for. 
Uh, the other thing I think it's safe to say, I think there's between 20 and 30 states that have adopted California's low carbon fuel standard as their own. So I think that's also pretty t telling when you start looking at the federal versus state level politics as well. Yeah, and there's a lot of different feedstocks and in the report that Aimpoint has put out, you know, kind of go through, itemize some of those feedstocks and the opportunities and challenges with with each of them. Uh, EPA even referenced, though, that there's a concern about feedstocks at, at this point. What, what, what did your research find about uh, how big of a concern feed feedstock supply should be? In the short term, I, it's not a concern of ours, but there's going to be some things that have to be worked out. And the reason I say that, if we look at all the options there are for feedstocks, so you've got tallow and animal fats, that's tapped out or contracting it. The supply that it can supply is pretty set unless there's major livestock expansion that happens in the United States. And given the margins there, I don't think that's going to happen for the next couple of years. You also have corn oil, which is what a bushel of corn can, there's such limited quantities of corn oil that comes out of a bushel of corn in the milling process. So that's a pretty fixed element or supply as well. That leaves you really soybean and canola, which there's an industry estimates out there from the soybean industry that it takes 40 more or 40 million more soybean acres. I don't think that's the case. What's going to happen is we're going to pull a lot of those our whole beans that are going out the Mississippi and to the world. Those exports are going to stay at home and we're going to do a, see a lot more domestic crush. So there'll be some acre expansion on the soybean side, but I don't think it's 40 million acres worth. The other thing is looking at canola then, I think in the U.S. especially, there's potential that we could see canola start creeping back in into some of those pockets up in the Dakotas and things where canola historically has been grown. And then you're going to have so you're going to have some of that competition between soy and canola because at canola, you produce significantly more, or what is it? I think three, three times, times. Three times the oil per acre that you use soybeans. So that's the element. Those dynamics all have to be sorted out. And that's why there'll be some pressure, but not a lot. And weather is going to be a big factor in that. Yeah, because Canada, you know, we're, we're you know, say, 20 to 23 million acres of canola. The, the acre is kind of tapped out. The rotation's already pretty short. There is some disease pressure that kind of prevents us, you know, unless there's some sort of big genetic change that allows us to to go, you know, back to back to back. And that doesn't seem to be very close at all. So that increased canola acre is going to have to come in the, in the plains. I, I am curious. And, you know, if, if you didn't do this work, that's fine. I'm curious at the amount, the, the number of acres that we could see that switch that, that that's going to be kind of fascinating to watch here over the next five to 10 years. It's something definitely to watch. We don't have any hard numbers on it. Uh, but it's definitely a factor to watch. The other thing I would say is, what is going to come out of this from an innovation perspective? So you're already seeing high oil varieties being developed in the soy space. To, and just think what a one or two percentage point increase in the oil content coming out of a soybean, how much more oil that will actually be. The other thing there, there's exploration happening on, can we have cover crops that are oil seeds? Can a, can a winter canola or cover crest be moved further south and then you have a cash crop as a cover crop? Maybe. There's some challenges there. And then the other thing from the innovation side are alternatives, algae oil, for example. Granted, I think there's still quite a bit of runway on some of those aspects, but there's also the question of what's what innovation is going to happen to actually increase our oil production. So, yeah. But what about EVs? There's obviously a huge push by the, the government in Canada, very much so by the Biden White House to... To, to push adoption of EVs, how, how big of a, I guess, a, a wrench into this is, is that is that push? I don't think it is one. And the reason that is, if you look at the EVs and where the adoption's happening, it is more in the passenger vehicle space. And I think COVID was a great period to paint this picture that during COVID, our gasoline consumption really dropped, but diesel actually stayed steady or even grew because everything's got to move. You got supply chains, you got products, whether it's a load of soybeans or a load of canola that's going from the farm to the grain processor and then out for export, that's got to move. Or consumer goods getting to Walmart's warehouses and then Walmart getting that to consumers, right? 
So things have to move. That's why I don't think EVs will necessarily have an impact on, especially in the large motor space. Um, the other thing you got to think about with electric vehicles, yeah, there's concepts out there where an electric semi, they got proof of concept on it, but there's still a lot of challenges around it on how much battery space do we actually have to have? How much cargo does that actually take up? Does it make trucks not economical then? Uh, so there's those challenges. The other big fuel consumption area would be aviation, but I think it's going to be a little while before we're flying battery powered planes. I think there might be some consumer adoption issues to you first. think about. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, thank you. Uh, so that's a big piece too, that I think the aviation and especially sustainable aviation fuel takes off. That's another spot where these feedstocks and stuff can go to. But yeah. again, overall, I don't think renewable diesel is not a transition fuel or is not, it's not going to get replaced by electric vehicles. It is here and here to stay. Yeah, that, that, uh, that makes sense that, uh, I, I understand that, uh, C- completely you know you're predicting that uh we're gonna s- currently in the u.s we have 2.6 billion gallons of renewable diesel by the end of 2024 that number could be 5.4 billion gallons what has to happen for that number to be achieved at 5.4 well i will say since we've published that report our estimates have changed on that oh. given the, the rvo's those requirements coming out, that has obviously pulled some people out of the market. And you're seeing some stalls from some of the recent announcements of, of Greenfield build that, hey, we're, we're not doing it. We're putting this on pause right now. So that estimate's coming down, but it, it'll it be in that three, three-ish spot, okay. I think, right now. Well, and that's one of my, that's one of the things I've been wondering is, you know, there's a there's been a lot of announcements, and we have seen some pullbacks in some of those investments, or you know, delays. We're we're pushing it out. There's you know, there's different ways to spin what each individual company is, is doing. Uh, we also have the rising situation with interest rates, so the financing some of the this capital investment is is probably a, a factor a, as well. You know, if you look at what's been announced in terms of the build out of crush capacity and renewable renewable diesel production, where are we at in terms of the estimates of what percent of that's actually going to get built? Do you have any idea? I don't have a direct answer for that, but that is definitely something I'd be willing to come back and uh, yeah. share you, more on in the future. Are you con- are, are you concerned about it that? That this 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 we're going to continue to have a pullback in, in terms of some of those announcements, or is that sort of already factored in, and whoever's going to back out is already backed out? Uh, I think there's some of that. There'll probably be a few more that back back out, but there needs to be clear more clarity. I think for some of those people making those investments of okay, where are we actually in terms of supply and demand? Great stuff. Jenna, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Keep up the great work there at Aimpoint Research and all the best to you. We'll chat again soon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Take care.